I would like to start off by asking you a question. If you were allowed to give only one answer to this question, what would it be? What is the most important process that has happened on the Earth since its very beginning? This thing. This is going to get you into heaven by giving the right answer. What would you say? There's all sorts of processes going on, but there's one process that is far more important than all others. And that is simply the transfer of heat from the interior to the outside of the Earth. But when you start to think about it, that controls so many processes. Obviously this, but sedimentary basins going up and down, the terrible earthquakes we had in Turkey uh, recently, those are the result of protection in the mantle giving stresses in the crust. And that in turn uh, is driven by removing heat in the interior. Now, throughout Earth history, by far the most important way in which heat has been transferred out of the Earth is by the rise of magma towards the surface. As it does so, it changed its composition. And that would be our differentiation. The change in the composition, we differentiate melts as they rise towards the surface. And that then gives us all the different rocks, which over all of geologic time has given us a differentiated planet with a crust. It's a very different composition from the magma. So differentiation of magma is an extremely important process. The trouble is, most of that differentiation goes on inside the Earth, where we cannot see it taking place. All we get to see is an igneous intrusion after it's solidified and then exposed by erosion thousands or millions of years later, and geologists come along with their hammers and they whack at it, they sample it, and they do isotopes on it, and they come up with these theories on how differentiation takes place. And geologists being very imaginative people have come up with an enormous number of ways in which magma can differentiate. But there is no unanimity on how magma is differentiated. We could give an entire course on magnetic differentiation. So I'm going to try to keep this lecture down to one hour or less. Um, Oh, by the way, before I leave this slide here, if you're wondering where that was, that was 2018 at event number eight, the Lower East Rift Dome of Kilauea. I was lucky enough to spend my 80th birthday there. And it's interesting that this vent is being fed by magma from way up here in Kilauea. The East Rift Zone goes down to here. And that's 40, 42 kilometers this way, 800 meters this way. And so that's the, like the hydrostatic head, driving the magma from here down here and it erupts here. But before this eruption began, Kilauea inflated, began expanding. And then an eruption started and the caldera collapsed. And magma came up here, and the volume of all this magma, this is one of the biggest eruptions in at least 100 years in Hawaii. Uh, the volume of that magma was the same as the volume of the caldera. So there was a direct connection of the volume. What erupted here was not this magma up here at all. This magma that came out was at least 20 years old. It had come from an earlier eruption. So this inflated here, pumped up here. That magma got this far and pushed out that magma there. This magma had changed its composition, so that's differentiation. But how did that go on? Somewhere in this plumbing system, we have differentiation going on, and it's complicated. So let's go to that. Now, it's just a symbolic mass of magma chain right here. It turns out 
Most magma never makes it to the surface. The best estimates that only whoops, sorry. Only 20% of the or less on mid ocean ridges, it's estimated that no more than 10% actually erupts onto the ocean floor. It's lava. The rest is dikes and bodies of magma down below. So, this is where differentiation is going to take place down inside the earth. The trouble is, this one way of looking at that in an active uh, magma chamber. Apart from seismologists looking at the velocity of seismic waves passing through there, they can figure out something about where the magma chamber is, but not the processes through. So, in a basalt magma chamber, we know that they can differentiate, produce diorite, and in the sweet case, granite. So, we get this range of rock type. That one magma. However, magma chambers are complicated. Uh, they're three dimensional, not long record. And if you look at an old one, you just have the erosion, the erosion surface giving you a two dimensional exposure. We don't know what the third dimension really was like. Also, you don't know what the boundary condition is. How deep was this magma chamber? In other words, what pressure is another? What temperature were these rocks at? We may not know that. We can look at metamorphic minerals and try and figure it out, but it's a problem. Also, this magma chamber was probably formed by one pulse and another pulse and another pulse. These pulses mixed. Again, making differentiation very difficult to uh, figure out. The only thing that all geologists will agree on is that magnetic differentiation involves the separation of crystals, in this case, all of the, from the liquid. Somehow they separate, and then it gives you different rocks, and then you separate more and separate more and change the sun. But how does that take place? Now, what we're going to talk about today is the differentiation that takes place in a single big flood basalt. I'm showing you the Columbia River in the northwest of the United States. The north states of the As they erupted, they kept going down and more erupted, and the bottom of them is now well below sea level. It was piling. Uh, It can take any one flow. The massive part here is the base, and that rubbly material is the top. So there's one flow. This is a body of magma. It's not down inside the earth. Very simple. It's a flat sheet. So it can be treated just as a one dimensional magma chain. You don't have to bother about this dimension, only that dimension. That makes the mathematics of calculating. How this thing cooled much simpler. We know the boundary conditions. So we know pressure. This was on the surface of the Earth. So atmospheric pressure above, pressure at the bottom will be just the weight of that body of lava. Uh, so the boundary conditions are known. If these flows Get to be more than about a hundred meters thick, you can find in there bodies of diorite and in granite. So the same differentiation you get in magma chambers deep inside the earth that happened right here in a lava flow that we can understand. So the benefit of studying this simple sheet of magma is that we can. Definitely show how this differentiation takes place. And then our conclusion at the end of the lecture would be if we know how it occurs there, and we say this must occur in the chambers down the side here, underneath the soupies.
The lava flow that I'm going to show you was erupted when the Atlantic Oceans first started to open. All the way down through here, a, a large number of dikes opened up in, uh, in the Atlas Mountains here, dikes as well, and lava flows erupted over this entire area, uh, forming thick flood basalts. However, most of them have been eroded away, and we only see them in down faulted basins. This is one particular dike. It can be traced. Oh, here's New York City right there, University of Connecticut right there. And this site goes all the way along the coast of Maine up into Canada. That's 500 meters long. It's a huge site. It's 50 meters wide. And that's where the lava came from, or the magma came from, which is formed in floods. So we'll take a look just here. See the Great Lakes over here. We'll look in this direction. There are the Great Lakes, New York City, University of Connecticut. This is that dike. From that dike, what results form over this whole area? Now, you're going to see that there were three dikes and three slopes, but this is good enough for our purposes right here. Uh, then, as after we pulled away from North America, uh, downfaulted basins started forming. The yellow, the, the blue lines are just uh, normal faults. And this tip, the horizontal lava flows down on the east side, they dip eastward, and on the west, they dip to the west. So the lava flows are now preserved by these red lines here. Now, where, where did this magma come from? And we, that's not important, really, for figuring out how it did It's nice to know that we can say something about where it came from. You'll notice that's an olivine crystal there, another one there, uh, and these are plagiar places. So those are the phoenix crystals. All the rest of the field is fine grain, and that's the liquid. That brought these crystals up. Does it contain plant glacial interest? Cannot come directly from the land. I should play this one statement though. So, this has come from some higher elevation. But initially, it must have come from the land. But you'll have to forgive me for putting in. A phase diagram here. Uh, there's plant clays, there's olivine. And this tetrahedron simply has plant clays, olivine, and then plinoproc, you know, logite over here, and quartz here. All of these flood basalts are what we call quartz stoliates. They eventually crystallize. So that's why we have quartz down here. They, this tetrahedron simply shows you that if you're in any particular part of it, say the this upper part here, plagiar plates would be the first little to crystallize. If you're down in this area here, your composition is here, it would crystallize all of it. If you were right on that plane there, it would crystallize both plagiar plates and all of it. Now, this, this diagram is useful to look at. Three dimensional, you can make it two dimensional by imagine putting, putting your eyeball right up there at the top and looking down on this surface here. In other words, you're going to say that this, we're only going to look at rocks that have a so project from plant place. So here now, projected, that gives us this diagram. So this is just the view of this surface here from the plagioclase projection. So it has plagioclase in it, right there, and here's olivine, plinoprops, and forth. 
I pointed on here a uh, number of analyses of this flood result that we're going to be looking at. And you will see that they're clustered along the line here. And yet, right here is the line that would bound the field of Audrey and Olive coexisting with planet. So you might think, oh, he's just a lousy chemical analyst. And if he'd done a better job, those points would have lied being right on this slide here. However, we find that at higher pressure, that boundary line shifts. And uh, Tim Grove at MIT has investigated this uh, phase diagram at elevated pressures, and this is what happens. At one kilobar, that line shifts to there. At 3.8 kilobars, that boundary is running pretty well through the middle of the analysis of that, this particular result. Um, at 3.8 kilobars corresponds to a depth of 12.5. So our best estimate is that the salt definitely rose from the mantle, but we don't really know anything about that. Um, and it must have stopped at 12.5 kilometers, where it developed that compositional range. And then from there, as Africa and North America separated, uh, the sedimentary basins formed up here, and the lava erupted and to fill in these basins is big, very thick lava flows. You can see what I've shown symbolically here is that the lava flow is going to be thickest near these waterfalls there, and thickest in the areas of the building. Here's the geological map of Connecticut, and this area in the center of the map is a Mesozoic basin of Triassic, Jurassic rocks. And these dark colored lines here are the lava flows, three of them. We're going to look at the thickest one here called the Holyoke basalt. Well, this, by the way, running up through here, that red line there is the dike that goes all the way on to Canada that fed these big lava flows. Oh, just I-91 there, that's the capital of Connecticut in Hartford. If you drive south on that road, this is what you're confronted with. The highway goes down and then curves around that hill. But that is 200 meters thick lot, just one flow. But you think in Hawaii, the average thickness of a flow is two meters. It's 200 meters thick. Uh, we measured very carefully sections through this lava flow, where it's different thicknesses. Thinnest over here in South Korea, 57 meters there, 174 meters, 198 meters there. One of the striking features about this lava flow is it has a very prominent boundary between the upper part with cooling fractures going down what we call the entablature, from the base where the fractures propagate up from the bottom of the flow, the colonnade. Now, this is not Connecticut. This is a relatively recent lava flow in Iceland that came down this river valley. There's a beautiful waterfall just off the screen here. This river valley had the lava come down 15 meters thick. And there's the edge of the old river valley. And you can see these fractures or columns turn here because they're perpendicular to the cooling surface. So it's easy to picture here that cooling from above, this river blown across the top, icy cold water coming off glaciers. Uh, so the top of that surface would have been kept at roughly zero degrees centigrade. The bottom down here would have immediately 
GDP at half the magma temperature. So, say 1200, uh, the rocks underneath would say zero degrees, so 600 degrees. So, this would be 600 degrees here, zero degrees there, and so this cools much more rapidly here than here. And there's a simple equation uh, that you can calculate the rate at which that takes place. This is the temperature at any point here or any point down here. This is the initial temperature of the magnet. And X is the depth at which this temperature occurs, say there, is the depth X. T is the time, and K is the thermal position. So you can calculate this and make you do. You come up with this result that the entablature should be two thirds the thickness of the flow, holiday one third. And it's what you would guess anyway, without doing any calculation. But it's nice that your intuition ends up giving you the same answer. Okay, now remember that that's obviously what should happen because cooling from above is faster than below. Now we will go to this thick flood dissolver in Connecticut. Over here, where the flow is thin, there's the boundary, and it's very close to one third uh, holiday, two thirds of the In other words, it cooled more rapidly. But as you go to thicker and thicker sections, you end up here. This is much thicker. It's the long way around. It's the way it is. Here, let me show you. Uh, a photograph taken from the airplane looking down into what is the longest quarry face in the world. This quarry face here can be followed for four and a half kilometers through the central part of this thick lava flow. There's the top of the lava flow is exposed along that lane, and the bottom of it is down here. That little house there is where Yale University gets water. Uh, it goes into a pipe there and goes under here. The reason this little area is left high is the pipe taking the water to Yale is going through there, so they need that to protect it. Uh, but, so this is a water reservoir. That is the waterfall on the edge of this necessary base. So the lava flow is dipping towards it. It's 200 meters thick. And there is the boundary between the tablature where it is above, from where it met to below. It's from where it was. It should be like that. It isn't. So, this is an extremely important point. How can you make a lava flow end up? And is the, the last cooling up here closer to the top than the bottom? It's not a cool class, so but there are the sediment, the sediments that are lying right on the top of this are fluid sediments. So we know rivers float across the surface of this lava right after eruption. That water thing down is you should have had a big Here's that boundary. You see, it's not straight like the Icelandic you know, curve with a bank in the middle of life. But this is cusping, and you can walk for four and a half kilometers. We're seeing these going all the way along. So, this cooled from above, this cooled from below. Now, unlike the Icelandic lava flow where you have beautiful columns, there are columns in here, but when actually get pulled in the way and the basin tipping over, you get a lot more fracture, so it's a bit less. But so there's the boundary. All the way along. The 
only possible solution is that as top was cooling hot, material must have fallen from the top and sunk to the bottom to build the bottom up. So continuously, material is falling off the, the roof, if you like. Uh, just imagine the paint dripping off the ceiling in here and accumulating on the floor. And the cooling up above keeps going on rapidly, makes this cool down, but material is sink. More than likely, the surface of this lava flow cooled and cracked, just like Hawaiian lava lakes do. This is looking very, very high up down on the surface of Kilauea lava lake. And you'll see that it's broken down into very large polygons, sort of the size of this room. There, I for scale, she's 1.57 meters tall. So just the scale here. Um, and you can see the surface has pumps on it. The water, when it rains, rains down into those and at long that fracture going down from there, you get the whole finger going down into the lava lake, or presumably back where our blood dissolved is forming. Same thing with the fact that water would trip it down. Can give you a series of cold fingers that would give you those pus. Here's what one of these intersections look like. So, extending down here would be fractured surface that would cool and cause the root to propagate down. What you're looking at here. Is the of a magma chain. There's actually no doubt this is cooling down the box. So imagine in here you look up at the ceiling. This is the ceiling. Here you see the ceiling of this magma chain. So it was like a, an egg car shape. Now material must have sunk. Now, from the tips of these cold fingers, sinks down and the material would have risen. See, this is narrow, this is broad. This is because what's going down is relatively cold and viscous. What's going up is hotter. But what goes down must be balanced by what goes up. This is more viscous, this is less viscous. So you get a large body sinking. A viscous material and a plume, a narrow plume of hot material rises. They balance. Now, this is an extremely important point. I'm not going to bore you with lots of textual analysis because you'd never remember this. But the lava remains exactly the same composition all the way down to there, it never changes. So as the roof was solidified and this material was falling off, it didn't change the composition of the magma. But that means that what was falling off the roof is not individual crystals which could have changed the composition. It had to be material, the same composition as the bottom of it. So here then, What's happening? The root material up here is rippling off and dripping down and accumulating here. Right. George Burgess has done mathematical modeling of this and it's called a dripping instability. It's the same thing as paint a ceiling. If your paint is too thick, it starts dripping. And his calculations take a response to this. He has a nice computer uh, model this happening. But this then transfers material from here and builds the bottom up 
So the eventual boundary here is two thirds the height. That's how the material accumulates. Unless you're sitting in the front row, you probably can't see this. But if you look, you can perhaps just make out some layering going through here. But if I do this, it'll help you. That red sheet there is a completely different block of salt. That is extremely a centimeter, a couple of centimeter crystal sign. The uh, rock diorite composition, not the salt, diorite. And then, I, I just showed you those sheets there. There are many of them. The thickest is 10 meters thick of diorite. And the top of these sheets, that thin line is brown. So here then is this thick salt flow. We have a solidified dripping material down at the bottom, and then sheets of diorite. And then in the top of those, granite forms. So we got three of the most important aviation rock types only in this model. Now, I'm using there's not a lot of granite there, but it is granite. Of granite here. It's granite. Here is a road cut through the same model in a different place. And the road cuts horizontal, but the lava flow is dipping, so I just tilted it up like this. We don't drive up hills like that in Connecticut. Um, but here you can see these sheets of diorite going through the basalt. That is a photograph, right? Here's that termination there. On See this one broken off here, that piece there, it is there. Now, if you were a geologist looking at the ancient uh, granite back or big back of the rock, and you saw uh, this material, you say, oh, that's an intrusion of some other magnet somewhere else. This is a lava flow from the surface of the earth, and there is nowhere else for this to come. It's actually formed in that lava flow by the differentiation. So these aren't coming from somewhere else. They're actually being generated right there in the lava flow. Now, we've done a, a lot of experimental work on this basalt. It, it melts, completely melts, at 1172 degrees centigrade. If you take the diorite here, this much darker colored rock, it totally melts liquid at 1134. If you take the basalt and you crystallize it until it's 35% crystals, 35% crystals, 65% liquid, 65% liquid has the composition of the diorite. So these sheets of diorite are separated from the basalt when it's just one third crystallized, 35 centimeters. So what is I found remarkable when I looked at these and found the temperatures is that this looks like a brittle material. It's practically any material going through. And yet, what is cracking here is 65% liquid, 35% solid. It, you know, it's like a paper towel. You can wring it out. It's really wet. Uh, so that's quite an amazing uh, discovery. Oops. That didn't happen in my presence. Thanks, Steve. Okay, that's better. <laughs> um, here's just one small one of uh, these sheets. As I say, they can be up to 10 meters thick. Uh, notice how fine grained the salt is. 
Part meaning the magnet like lots to look at this. But here you can see big flat plays and curvature crystals in the diorite. That's diorite. That's granite. Notice there's no rock between diorite and the basalt shape produced diorite. I'm going to produce something with a little more silica all the way to granite. It doesn't. It's either diorite or granite. That's it. You do a mental experiment. You may never have melted a rock before, but you can easily just take and stick it in a furnace. As you probably know, rocks don't just melt in one temperature like an ice cube. Uh, they melt over a range of temperature, about 200 degrees, sort of typical range. But take two graphite crucibles, just little crucibles like this, and cut a block of salt and stick it in the other crucible where you can hold. Then Put another crucible underneath and then put it in a furnace and start in the temperature up. What would happen? Well, just thinking of what's going to happen. The little cube of the salt there is going to start and melt. It doesn't have to totally melt. It turns out just a very small amount of melt makes it go all the shape this thing with drop down and you get that. So that's what we expect to happen. So let, we'll take a piece of the salt with the chilled margin of the lava flow. Notice the chilled margin. Nice fresh rock. There it is. We put this in the furnace and right the temperature. And it begins to melt. Exactly what we expect. So no surprises. Now, if you take a piece of basalt from amongst those sheets of diorite, have a little blocked out, and put it in the same experiment, this is what we get. Now, this was shown on the uh, cover of Nature magazine many years ago. Um, but this is quite a rock remarkable, simple experiment to do, but it's an amazing result. It's 70% melt, but the cube is still sitting there and the liquid is dripping out. This, this doesn't happen when you take the chilled margin of the salt. It only happens when you put the salt up in the flow. So that little, the cube you can see is beginning to suck in on the side, it's pulling through. But uh, it's holding itself. There's something there standing like this. Keeping the structure, and yet all the liquid is pouring out of the pump. You're going to see that liquid as the composition of diorite. But let's just cut a thin section through that cube now, 70% melt. And this is what you find. All the browny colored material is glass. That's the liquid. And what you find is that the plagioclase crystals. Form a network which is being traced throughout. So this is like you know, you know, your your ribs holding your body. There's a lot of liquid, but your ribs, your backbone hold it. These final base crystals hold this up in that shape. But when I found this out, I want to look at the important how this stuff uh, holds itself together. So I did a cat scan. Just like if you went into when you cracked your head and you went to a hospital, they would do a CAT scan and they you know, the x-rays go shooting through here. These are just two little cylinders that I partially melted. And this is one x-ray horizontal x-ray slice through that. And then you put all these slices together in the computer and you create this, which is the the color intensity here is sort of the grayscale that's being changed into color here. What is shown as yellow in here is plagioclase. The green is melt, and the blue is currency. 
Now, the nice thing about doing a CAT scan is you can make a thin section. You don't have to get your hands dirty or saw and cut or anything. You simply, on your computer, you slice it. And here, I didn't make a thin thin section. It's just the rectangle out of it. But that's cut out of that cylinder in the computer. Now, I had this in a, a, a movie, and I was going to rotate uh, the things on the side of that movie, of course, and on, on his transfer, and obviously planting here. But um, what you see here is the whole rock melted. You see a lot of green is the belt. This is the plastic place, because in the computer, you can just select a particular range of intensities of absorption in the x-rays, which is changed in color. So that is the plagioclase, and this is the pyroxene. The pyroxene, you can see, are just little bits like this. They're separate. They don't touch one another. The plagioclase, however, forms a network. Yeah, this is extremely important to figuring out how this differentiation is going to be. Here is that experiment I did. I turned it upside down, which is cheating, but uh, what we're going to do is say, if this is a crystal mush. Now, a crystal mush is something in which the crystals touch, in contrast to a suspension, like mud in a river is a suspension because the particles are separated by what a mush here requires that all the crystals connect. Doesn't mean there's no liquid there, but they must connect. And this mush here, you know, it's 30, 35% crystal, 70% liquid. Liquid's coming up here and now. So picture this mush here. And now, in the lava flow, in this mush, you have crystals of phytoplasm and pyroxene. You take their densities, and their bulk density is slightly greater than that of the liquid by 220 kilograms per cubic meter. It's not much, but when you calculate that that's enough, it causes to compact. When it compacts, the liquid is squeezed out and Gravity did it here in my experiment, but here, compaction of that crystal mush would expel the liquid, and up in that area there would be where these sheets of diorite. Now, oh, uh, hmm. Oh, yeah, there we go. This is the tax stand of the actual rock that I partially melted with. What I have done here and here is to use Photoshop um, and simply squash the photograph on the computer. So this is being now, if I gave you that, you say that looked it's hard to say. Over here, I squashed it 30%. And I think here, you can start to see you know, that looks like it's been squashed. Obviously, if I had squashed it much more, it would just be a set of sheets like that. So, you can imagine this is what would happen if you had an action. But the question is, was the original rock that I did the CAT scan on, was that, was it initially this way, and it was compacted that? Here now is how This is just a regular epigraphic intersection. The important thing here is, you notice that this says up, and that says north. These samples are collected very carefully before they're broken off the rock. They're all labeled with 
what was originally vertical, notice the columnar joints in the basalt was taken as the original vertical, and north. The north is not important enough, it could have made it east west, it happens to be north, it is an oriented sun. And uh, this is a drawing. All these little plagioclase crystal chains. See, there's an obvious one going up through there, goes up to there. You just have to draw all these and digitize it on the computer, and you end up with this. But the question is is that network there? Let me just take a little piece of the network right here. What I did was to run traverses in one direction all the way through the thin set. These lines are placed fractions of a millimeter apart. So in a single thin section of that side, you can end up with meters long lines, vertical lines, and you measure the intersect here. Then, when you've done that for the whole thin section, you rotate, rotate your lines 10 degrees, come through the network, out in the intercept, and then rotate it again, measure again. And as you do that, you can see that as you change the direction, the mean intercept changes. It becomes less right here at 90 degrees. You can see this one line here, right there. That is much shorter than going across. But you're going to do this statistically through the entire thin section. And that then gives you these measurements here. Then from that, you can fit an ellipse to the data. That you get the action. So here, that particular thin section we were looking at shows that these networks are slightly shorter this way than they are this way. And if you assume that they were originally east in all directions, it was a circle, a circle to find the limits. And it gives you about 11% action. So that's one way of doing it. But here, take that same network and you digitize it like this on the computer. You just click with the mouse and you go around clicking away and you get little lines like this. But each one of those lines is a vector, it has a direction and length. So you can plot this line here, for example, give you that point there. But you could have started here and gone this way, so that's also this point there. But you do this for every one of the line segments in this entire network, and you end up with something that looks like a shotgun blast. And then there's statistical ways of picking an ellipse to that data. So that's another way of doing it. That's the link vector method. There's a third way of doing this. And that is simply to take the thin section and lay a grid. Doesn't matter what size you make this grid, you can make it have an enormous number of points. This needs more computer time calculating. So let me just zoom in on part of this. So here are the grid points. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. From each one of those points, you draw lines out. And so they intersect the boundary. Now, I didn't realize this when we started this. Turns out, statisticians have done an enormous amount of work on this in setting up security plans. If the Mona Lisa was over in here, this security camera wouldn't see it. That would not be good. And so, statisticians have done all the work on this. And so we simply apply that to this thin section. So this is the third way in which we can do this. Then you get an ellipse to those and get an average ellipse. So here now for that one thin section, you have the 
intercepts, gives a maximum there. The link vector is that one. And those last ones, the visibility polygons, the security cameras are, are there. And these are 95% uh, confidence limits. You can see that we're pretty certain using those three different methods that this block is originally by about anywhere from 11 to 12%. This is not just an ordinary piece of salt. Uh, uh, here's another thin section. The trouble is that it requires an enormous amount of work to do all this digitizing, and then you end up with one sum of another, another, another. This is where you need help. So I got my one chair, stand up and take a bow. She did all the hard work. <laughs> Um, they, they just quickly now she doesn't know what the grant she knows their cost so that and also when I gave them the insect, I didn't some of them were more long axis insects, she was vertical, other ones were horizontal. She didn't know that. But every time when we did this analysis, <laughs> no, that's the wrong color. It wasn't white wine, it was red wine. But any cameras in this, you can But now, here are the three different methods link the intercept, link back to star product, for these samples going up through a 174 meter thick section of the flow. And you see the three different methods agree nicely and show. That the compaction reaches a maximum of about 12% at a height of 45 meters. This, we're certain of, there's no doubt that material was squashed by that amount. But previously, John Newton wanted to take a bunch of analyses through this lava of flow and got something that looked like this graph over here. This is the weight percentage. I think in the model. So notice I reverse the axis. This is higher, this is lower. And you can see it goes up here and here. It looks just the same shape as this. Now, titanium is interesting because titanium remains not only for the early crystals. So if you pack these crystals down, the liquid goes up and takes the titanium with it, what we call incompatible element. Titanium leaves and depletes this in uh, So here now, you might have interpreted this as being the result of compaction. But I know it's the result of compaction simply because we have a direct measure. So here now, we know how this is solved differentiating. Uh, Alan Boudreau at Duke University has devised a very, very nice program that he designed and actually looked at the push bell in the world's largest state distribution to study how it might have generated a platinum billion deposits. Now, uh, here we're going to have to see if this movie worked. We've had trouble with it before, but I think it will. Um, there are three graphs here. This is going up through the first. 40 meters of the lava flow. Uh, this is titanium and magnesium. And this is the measured compaction. Now, what this computer program does is just thermodynamic program how the magnets how long. Okay. It's purely on thermodynamic. Then it uses the a fluid flow, then you're going this way, and a flush going that way. Both treated this way, because this one, of course, is much in a very viscous return, fluid going up. Fluid. Uh, so that's what this computer program does. Now, what I'm going to do here is show you five years of cooling. That's not very long, uh, it, but it's, it's a reasonable time for the lava flow. Solidify up to the bottom. So here now, 
that the lava will be solidifying up in the bottom, but there'll be compaction going on. So let's set the thing run and see if we can This hopefully will loop. So if you miss it the first time, you can see it the next time. You can see that as the compaction goes on here, the magnesium in the lower part of the lava flow is increasing, but decreasing up here, being compacted down here, dilated up above. And there you can see the magnesium in this computer model of, uh, of Boudreaux's gives a very, very nice fit to the magnesium. The titanium isn't bad, but in the computer model, it goes to lower values. And the reason for this is that titanium is not only But you can see that the measured compaction that we've got ends up fitting very nicely, calculated. Now, in this zone here is where the dilation takes place, and that is where the diagram sheets. It's up there, the result gets dilated, eventually fractured. Even though it's only 35% crystallized, it breaks because it's just a simple experiment, a little block it has been because of those high-quality exchange networks. So here then we have the basalt compacting, generating the diamond, but we've got granite. Nothing you can do. That's the last thing we need to say. Probably all the rest of the the remains of the indigenous international petition. I eat all spaghetti. That, that's all that's left over. So I put in the either the spaghetti. It's the crystal blunt. Uh, it's long chain culture. Um, so this, the crystals are gone, but this is the residual uh, liquid with these immiscible liquids, oil and water. But if we look, going back to that thin section we had in the salt, in the rapidly cooled chilled margin at the upper part of the flow, um, if you look, in these dark areas here, that's the very last liquid to solidify in the basalt. And so it's there, that's what we want. Just load it with and this is the liquid. One is clear, it has a composition of granite. Another one, which is dark brown, black, uh, is very iron rich, composition of an iron rich rocks. And now here's my favorite one, the big glossy drop looks like the cartoon characters. Um, but here you can see this is the silica rich gloss here, and this is the iron rich droplet here and the iron rich droplet. So in the rapidly cooled part of the flow, these are quite these invisible things. Glass. We know there was a misbuilding there. In the more slowly cooled part, those papers are eventually going to crystal. If you take the basalt at a liquidous temperature of 1172, you cool it down, 1134 is 35% crystallized. If you remove that liquid, you've got a diorite here. But if you keep cooling this down, but it's 85% solidified, you get to 1018 degrees centigrade. And this is a liquid form. The, the last liquid splits into two, one iron to the other silver. But by that time, and this is what you can do. It's stuck there in the in between crystals. But if at this point you separate the diuretic liquid and you cool it down, it also hits. In the stability field in 1018, but it's still 65%, uh, only 65%. So now it's possible to separate the, uh, the granitic liquid 
and segregate it to form these basic red. So we have action going on here to expel a liquid of diuretic composition. And that diuretic liquid, as it cools, its residual liquid hits the two liquid field, and these liquids manage to do segregate and separate to form the granite. We form the three water block types in this uh, one line. Now, this picture also is that road cut in the lava flow. But in a magma chamber down the side of the earth, it's going to crystallize and go through uh, the same process. Because when a magma crystallizes, the bulk density of the crystals is always greater than the residual liquid. And it does not take a lot of density difference to drive the action. Then the liquid is expelled upwards. So you can imagine that many magma chambers should have uh, features like this. And um, so imagine that might have an effect. One place, seismologists looking, say, under the East Pacific run, they know this magma is up to all the time. They look for magma chambers, and what they see, the interpret seismic record is being a pile of crystal mush with lenses, small lenses of liquid. And I would suggest that what they're looking at is exactly what we're seeing here in this lava flow, possibly considerably thicker. Um, and, and that, those are what the magma chambers look like under the mid ocean. But here then is the conclusion. Uh, Giovanni remembers this because we stood there and looked in there. Uh, this is 2005, Earth Alley in the Akbar Triangle. But we stood there and we cooked the heat coming from this was enormous. But one of the first conclusions we can draw is that thick bodies of magma must convey, not so much due to thermal difference, but due to dense, density contact between crystal mush. And the residual liquid. And we watched this uh, lava being up here, big gas bubble bursting here, and the whole surface of this lava went across and then disappeared down in there. So this was a giant convection cell taking material, and some of this material that you see here probably headed up somewhere down on the bottom, just like I was showing you in the thick flood result. Uh, in thick flood result flows, uh, differentiation definitely takes place as a result of crystal mush action. And with these methods that I showed you, you can calculate the action. Then you can do all your chemistry and this to compare it. And here, this is uh, important. Point that differentiation takes place not by separation, but in the salt. But in the salt, salt magnets occurs in a very, very late stage where it has trouble separating, but if you put a fractionated result of magnets, it directly tends to separate the rigid fraction. So the final conclusion we can make is that. If this differentiation occurs in a lot of folks sitting on the surface of the earth that cools in tens of years, and in magma chambers, they sitting up here under Vesuvius that sits there for thousands of years, the amount of action must be enormous and give you a tremendous expulsion of action-making liquid. So that, I think, is the most important. Just one parting comment. Here's some old timers here. In our younger days. <laughs> yeah. Two years ago. Two years. Anyone from the United States? That was an exciting trip. We were sent into the AFAR to uh, investigate a brand new volcano. The governor of the AFAR wanted to know whether he could let the people back into the air. 
I really know. <laughs> we had fun investigating. Okay, thank you very much. If anyone has any questions, I'm way too quiet. Yeah. Any questions? I do find you like that. Um, you would have loved me this No, but I don't care about it. <laughs> <laughs> now, is that any meaning with the, the, the typical high um, modality of the full pass of the, the sequences? The final, the salt, and. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Is that any it's meaning with this, uh, this process? I would like to say yes, but I really don't think there is, because to get myelite out of the salt, you've got to go so far down. 85% in the case of this one. Uh, for mid ocean rich basalt, these are coarse foliates, but if you take an olive foliate, you have to crystallize it even more to hit the two of the liquid. But you do get there. But by that time, there is so little liquid left, it's hard to separate it. And the amount you get is very small. There's an areas where you have bimodal bulk of salt right salt with quite a bit of biomass. More so than um, you would get by just differentiating the result of the pigment. But there, maybe, you know, isotopes would tell you that, that the rhyolite is maybe in the partial melting of crustal loss being added in there, yeah, which would change the over existing process. Yeah. So there is no. In you. Ask it, are you talking about um, basalt, diorite, uh, yeah. so some sort of yeah. diagnosis? Yeah. 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 Well, it's true. In three, I guess. After all, it's three. I didn't mention this, but if you look at this factor of differentiation, a suspension, remember, just particles to work my around, a mush, the crystal sample can end. The this basalt, they have. So that's the first time you can get, you can only get back when you have a mush. Part that, you can have a second person. But in this basalt, plastic plate is closed. It's, it's less dense than the salt. That doesn't do us any good. All of you can say that that never gets things on. But when it's a, a, a mush, then both crystals sink together. So that's, that happens when it reaches 25% 20, crystallite. Most of the diorite here corresponds to a composition 35% crystallite. By the time it gets to be 20% crystallized in this basalt, it's become too rigid to compact it. So you never get more than 12% compaction. But if this was in a magma chain of heat in the earth, that compaction on longer and get slightly harder down, down to the fresh air. So you get the salt, the original. Then during the mush stage, you generate diorite. Then you can look at the scare part. You get all these then you get to the ferrodiorite. Well, this is this is no time. Red that well, this is a ferrodiorite. Ferrodiorite, and then in that, you get sheets of red up here. Exactly what we have here. And of course, they've got all sorts of just liquid down here. So, yeah, yeah, yeah it's it's red, you know, with nothing in between, with this mechanism. Okay, I probably bored you long enough. <laughs> Okay. Any question from uh, from remote? Yeah. 
I think you gave a very right point for our scientists to say, because, for example, it's easy to Yes, that really is always a problem. Mixing the, in the case of this soft bottom, um, I have to be careful that it didn't get to the same by having what's called inflation. You get a very thick lava flow like this. The eruption continues and it pumps material in. That's how many of the Columbia River salts that are seen south as clay, but those are affected by inflation. But an interesting thing is that each pulse of magma coming in get a layer of bubbles. So you get multiple layers of bubbles that show when each separate intrusion comes in. In this flow here, it's only one set of bubbles. So it's just one huge sheet. Well, that's why you look back Dinosaurs. You have dinosaurs. You show the larger base. What about that one? The one? Oh, that was the one. Yes, in, in the CD. Yeah, it's in the CD. Yeah, they, they, yeah, there were a couple because. And when you melt the rock and the surface, it will not get any bubbles at all. But then, when the x-rays go through, the only way you can tell the difference is from this x-ray absorption. And the bones show up. Um, but here, it turned out that an air ball has, you know, the x-ray goes straight through. Um, the the plagiarist place was the least absorbed. Other than the gas bubble. The uh, pericene was next, and then the melt had a lot of iron in it, so it exited. So, fortunately, they were able to uh, distinguish what is true. That, that particular picture there hangs in the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C. They put a lot of money in the University of Texas, set up this CAT scan looking at rocks. And they thought this was a very nice use of it. And so the person who runs that casting said that. So that's now a great picture of all the living city and taxpayer money. <laughs> Another question? Okay, so thank you very much again. Thank you all. Great. Thank you for making me feel really happy.